Jesus' name. And our message is coming from 1 Samuel 4, verses 5 to 11. 1 Samuel 4, verses 5 to 11. It's 1 Samuel 4, verses 5 to 11. Everybody had to say amen. Ooh. Okay, I want to. 1 Samuel 4, verses 5 through 11. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rained again. And when the uh, Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout? Look how many times shout is this mis uh, mentioned in these three uh, verses. I want to start all over again because I love it. And when the ark of the covenant of the Lord came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang again. And when the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, What meaneth the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? And they understood that the ark of the covenant was come into the camp. And the Philistines were afraid. And they said, God is coming to the camp. And they said, Woe unto us. For this for there had not been such a thing here to here to for in other they have never heard a great shout of all these men shouting and they said I, I have never heard this before this thing before so when they heard it they said woe unto us who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods when they heard all this shout all of the shouting all these men you know they voices are deep they said, whoa, who oh, thank you, Jesus? He said, he said, whoa, they said, woe unto us. Who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that smote the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. And, and then verse 9, they said, be strong. So they encouraged themselves. We listen to a song, the minister of music, play, uh, a minister of music, Sharice Auburn played today that encourage us. Is now this is what they're doing. It says, Be strong. So tell you to encourage yourself. Be strong and quit yourselves like men, O ye Philistines, <laughs> and ye be not servants unto the Hebrews as they have been to you. Quit yourselves like men and fight. And then on uh, uh, verses 10. And the Philistines fought, and Israel was smitten, and they fled every man into his tent, and there was a great slaughter, and there fell, for there fell of Israel, 30,000 footmen. In the last verse, verse 11, and the ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli is hot meat. And filling, filling is it's hot meal. Let me go back and pronounce this right. It's called hot meal and filling, filling, filling us. Hot meal and filling us. So I go online and ask them how to pronounce these names. These names in, in the Old Testament, as y'all know in the past, I've had problems, but I try. It's hot meal and filling That's their name. And they had, and filling us, and, and the Ark of the Covenant was taken, and the two sons of Eli were killed. Now the title of my message is, What's in Your Shout? What's in your shout? The Hebrew meaning for shout is to split the ears. So when they heard the Israel, I think it was, uh, I don't know how many thousands of men, I'm going to bring it out. When they heard it, they were scared. They said, woe with us. Because that noise was so loud, it's like it split the ears. So the Hebrew meaning, again, for shout, is to split the ears. And it also means to a cry of excitement. So I was sitting in a church years ago, 
and all of us was shouting and dancing. And some was running around the church. Some of them was running out of the church. And then coming back in, having a good time in the Lord. When all of a sudden, I heard a soft voice that made me so sad, saying they are shouting over their sins. He said they were shouting over their sins. The Holy Spirit grieved within me, grieved, and I began to sit in service and tears running down my eyes. The Lord was not talking about everyone, only those who are living a life of a hypocrite. He said they are shouting over their sins. They got sin in them. They live in a life of a hypocrite, and they are shouting as if they live a holy life. So that's why he entitled this message, What's in Your Shout? So in 2 Timothy 3, 5, and 7, it says, Having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof, from such turn away. So these people that shouting over their sin, they have a form of godliness. They pretending like they're saved. They have one foot in the church and one in the world. They do everything that they want to do and they come into church pretending like they're saved and when the music come on, they are shouting over their sins. Lord Jesus, help us. And for this, is it for of this sort that they are, that they creep into houses. I'm going to say it again. 2 Timothy 3, 5 to 7. They have a form, a form of godliness, but they deny the power thereof and the Lord telling the body of Christ from some from such turn away. For of this sort, these kind of people, are they which creep into houses and lead captive silly women. I preached a message a long time ago saying, Don't be a silly woman. They are laden with sin, led away with divers of lust, even ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So I began to pray right then, and I said, Lord, help us to take holiness serious. Jesus paid a painful price when he died on the cross for our sins. He died to bring all of us, the whole world, back to God, which Satan stole from Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. So in 2 Peter 1, 10 and 11, it says, Wherefore the wrath, brother, give diligence to make your calling and election sure. We've got to make sure that we are counted worthy to stand before our Savior, worthy to escape the horrible tribulation that's coming upon this world which is the wrath of God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. For if you do these things, when you read further in 2 Peter, the upper verses like 1 through 9, is you shall never fall. There are some things that we can do in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 9, that we, the Bible said, if we do these things, we shall never fall. We shall never be shouting over our sins. We shall never be a hypocrite. One thing in the church and another thing in the world. One thing in the church and another thing on your job and in school. And you're coming in church being a hypocrite. Lord Jesus, the Bible says the hope of a hypocrite shall what? Fall. So we thank God for his word. Hallelujah. For, for so an interest the Bible says, shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom. If we do these things, if we do 2 Peter 1, 1 and 9, he named it. He said that we should have, we should be the, for, for so an entrance, an entrance, like an entrance, the door is open, shall be ministered unto you abundantly into the everlasting kingdom. There is an everlasting kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. 
So Christian, born again believers, the body of Christ must make absolutely sure that our praise, our worship, hallelujah, and our shout is holy and acceptable unto God. He will not accept anything else. In Titus 1 and 16, he said they possess, profess that they know God, but in works they deny him, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work of reprobate, and that means perverted and corrupt. In 1 John 2 and 4, the he that said, I know him, and keep not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. See, a holy God will not be in the midst of unholy shouting like the men of Israel thought he would be. So God only accept and honor, holy shout, a holy praise, a holy worship. See, God is holy and sacred. Hallelujah. God, Jehovah God, is Kardash. Jehovah Kardash means that he is holy. And, verse, uh, and then in the beginning of this chapter, 4,000 Israelites were killed by the Philistines, the Philistines. And when the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Wherefore have the Lord beaten us today before the Philistines? It is so sad that the leaders didn't know that there was something wrong with their spiritual life and their relationship with God. So they asked, why did we lose this war? They said, let us fetch, bring the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord out of Shiloh unto us, that when it comes among us, it may save us out of the hand of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh that they might bring forth, bring forth, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of Hosts was dwelled amongst the cherubims, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant with the, of God. Now I want to give you some background information on Samuel because he plays an important part in this message. Now Hannah was married to Echonite. And she was not able to bear him children. She went to God in a consecrated, focused prayer and pleaded with him to give him a child. So Hannah made a promise to God that she would give the child back to him. At first, Eli thought Hannah was drunk, but soon found out she was in deep, intense prayer to God. She wanted something from God that only God can give her. Eli, the priest said, go in peace when he realized that she was really praying and seeking God. And he pronounced a blessing over her. And may God, the God of Israel, grant thee thy portion that thou had asked of him. God answered Hannah's prayer and she became pregnant with Samuel. And after she weaned, after he was weaned from his mother, she took him to the temple and left him there as promised. Now look at the difference between Samuel. And you can live among wicked people even in your house and still be saved. Samuel grew up to be a great and honorable priest, prophet, and judge over Israel. Samuel refused to allow Eli's two wicked sons, Hophni and Phinehas, to ruin his godly character or influence him. We can live for God in this world, on your job, in the school, in the college, in your home. Hallelujah. We can live for God. That's why Jesus said, I didn't, he said, I'm not taking you out of the world. I'm praying that God will what? Keep you in the world. We can be kept by the power of the Holy Spirit and God's word. So God used Samuel to warn Eli of the future destruction 
that will come upon his household. Lord Jesus, Hophni and, uh, and Phineas, uh, Eli, two sons were evil and wicked. They were evil and wicked. They were criticized for engaging, listen to this, what they were doing. They were criticized for engaging in dishonest behavior, such as taking the best portion of the sacrifices for themselves and listen to this and what is done even today. And having sexual relationship with the sanctuary serving women. Even having sex among each other, spiritual incest among each other. And we are the high priests of holy royalhood unto the Lord. And we're doing what these boys was doing back then. These women, the, the sanctuary serving women, gathered around the entrance and donated their copper mirrors, mirrors to, to the making of the washboard. This is what they were doing. They went there to be for those, those two brothers to have sex with. And so they were their purpose there were, were to, they, now I'll say it again, these women gathered around the entrance and donated their copper mirrors to the making of the basin, which was wash bowls, where the priests, which these boys were, would wash before entering the sanctuary. This was their purpose. Lord Jesus. And Ephesians 5 and 8, this is what is it for you were sometimes. We're not supposed to be doing this. We're all royal priesthood, a holy nation, a purchased people. Hallelujah. We're special, we're purchased, we're set aside to be holy. Is it for you were? We were in darkness. But now you, you, you are light in the Lord. We are supposed to be the light in the Lord. We walk as children of light. If we are light in the Lord, we're supposed to walk as children of light. We're supposed to see some type of light in us. Amen? Amen. But the sons of Eli refuse to walk in the righteousness of God. So when the Ark of the Covenant came into the camp, all again Israel shouted with a great shout so that the earth rang again. Tens of thousands of Israelite, Israelite men shouted so loud, the land shaped and perhaps even echoed and added, and that added to the noise. So they, they were shouting, then it was an echo, echo, um, echo. So as they were shouting, they were hearing echo. That's why it scared the, the Philistines. They said, how many men was in there? The 4,000 men probably sounded like 12,000. They were scared. So the word green mean claim, thundered, and echoed. The men shouted a loud claim, thundered, clanned, like those clan, claim just claim, thundered and echoed, shout that quaked the atmosphere in the camp. They wanted the Philistines to know that God was in the camp. But Jeremiah 51 and 20, it says, Thou art my back and weapons of war. Who wouldn't want God in the camp? Who wouldn't want God to fight our battle? I'm going to say it again. Jeremiah 51 and 20. Thou art my battle axe and weapons of war. For with thee will I break in pieces the nations, and with thee I will destroy kingdoms. Whoa, glory. What a mighty God we serve. So at first, when the Philistines heard the great noise of the shout from the camp of the Hebrews, they said, "What?" again, I just want to repeat this. They said, what means the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews? Because they knew, they knew about the ark of the Lord that had come into the camp and they thought that God has come into the camp with them. So when they knew that the ark came and they heard the shout, they said, surely God was in the camp with the Hebrews, ready to fight and destroy us. And that's why they said, woe unto us, for there has not been such a thing up until now. Woe unto us. They said this twice. The Philistines, they were scared. Woe unto us. 
The Philistines had no idea that God was not with Israel. When they said, woe with us, woe with us. The word woe means we are defeated, we are defeated, we are defeated, we are destroyed. Who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that spoke us. I want to repeat this, the Egyptians with all the plagues in the wilderness. So the Philistines feared Israel to such a degree, as I said in the above scripture, that they called the men of Israel mighty God. But look what happened. Then all of a sudden, the Philistines began to encourage themselves they said, be strong, be quit, that's Q-U-I-T, it means be brave and mature like men, O ye Philistines, that ye be not servants unto the Hebrews, and they have been to you yourselves. He said, equip yourself, get yourself ready, be brave, and be like men, and get ready to fight. But notice this, all Israel shouted. They all shouted in one accord. They were united. United they stood ready to fight and win. All the men was about to discover, and it's sad to say, that they was not, they was not ready. Hallelujah. All the men was about to discover something that they were not prepared for. And the Philistines fought. And Israel was beat and there was a great slaughter and they fell on Israel 30,000 footmen they killed 30,000 if all Israel had repented of their sin and asked God to forgive them God would have given them the victory over the enemy See, Israel was beaten before the Philistines because of sin. The Israel, the men, the 30,000 men was beaten by the Philistines because sin was mixed with their shout. Sin was in the camp. Therefore, God let the enemies defeat them. And the ark of God was taken. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas was killed. This must be reiterated to Christians today. No matter how loud you shout, the tears running down your face, running up and down the aisle and out of the church door, Hallelujah, how long sin will keep God out of your back. Sin, hallelujah, will keep God from fighting against your enemies. Sin was in the camp. Sin was in their heart. Sin that they did not repent for and they had broken their relationship with God. The Israelites, the Israelites shouted, shout revealed several important things. The men was united to such a degree that it caused the earth to quake and briefly, temporarily, distress the enemy to a point of fear. All the men had a false confidence of victory by having the art. Hallelujah. It gave them hallelujah that it caused them, it would cause them to cause the enemies to panic. The Philistines called them gods and made them think back to when they smote the Egyptians with every kind of plague. And also, the men believed that God was with them, that they would deliver, that he would deliver them Again, I keep delivering them out of Egypt from their enemies. But, Gal but Galatians 6 and 7 says, Be not deceived. 
God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that shall he also reap. And lastly, woe unto us that the Philistines said more than one occasion turned into their victory. They realized they had no reason to fear Israel. Oh my Lord. What was Israel seeing? They were corrupt in religion and moral values. They had gone far off from God. They had backslidden and went far off from God. Their shout was corrupt by their immoral values, so their shout also was far off from God. Israel thought they could use God anytime, anywhere. When they wanted him, but God proved them wrong. He was also far off from them, like they were far off from him. In James 4 and 8, it says, draw nigh to God. Is there ever a time for us to draw nigh to God? People of God, it is now. And his Bible says, and he will draw nigh to us. See, there's a condition God just don't want to give and never receive from us. The love that he gives, he wants to receive. The commitment that he gives, the devotion that he gives, the loyalty that he gives, he wants to receive from us. And it also says, excuse me, cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double mind. This is found in James 4 and 8. It also says, be afflicted and mourn and weep for your sin. Let your laughter be turned into mourning and your joy to heaviness. Be mourning and heaviness about your sin. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. He will fight your battle. This message is a resounding warning for Christians today. There are seven major points in this message. Number one. God did not stop Israel from shouting. He, didn't, he let them shout as long and as loud as they wanted. They could have shouted 40 days and 40 nights. He was going to let them shout. But it was to no avail. The Philistines, which is Israel's enemies, realized that the presence of God was not with Israel. Now, that number three, God revealed to Israel that their great shout was a waste of time. Number four, Israel's shout was nothing but a loud thundering and irritating noise. Do we want that kind of shout going before God today? You thinking you shouting and sweating, going to church, I had a good time. No, I said, your, your shout was nothing but an irritating noise to me. Number five, Israel was deceived into believing that possessing the art of God meant that God was with them. Number six, without God on our side, it's like living in this world without water. Oh Lord, I heard these words so many times when I be became a born again believer, a babe in the Lord. They used to say all the time when the praises go up, the blessings come down. Israel shout went up. But God's blessings did not come down. Don't be deceived. They were utterly defeated by their enemies. And then in Isaiah 59 and 1 and 2. Behold. Now look at this for God. Behold. The Lord's hand is not short. That it cannot save. Neither his ear heavy that it cannot hear. But he said, but your sins, your iniquity, have separated between you and your God. And your sins have hidden his face from you that he will not hear. He, he didn't want to hear. He heard, but he ignored. He said, I'm not going to, I hear, but I'm not going to, I'm not going to answer your prayers. I'm going to hear and ignore. God wants the church to know 
that your shouting is in vain, fruitless and dead, when it is mixed with when sin is in the mix. When sin dwells in your heart, when sin is in your life. If Israel's shouting was filled with a holy life, a dedicated, committed, and loyal life to God, a loyal life to God, they would not have been defeated. I cannot emphasize this enough to the church. Israel shouting did not impress God at all. God removed himself from the battlefield before they even began to shout. God don't do things in the last minute. He watches. His eyes go to and forth, beholding the good and the evil. Israel was taken, Israel had taken for granted that their shout would move the hand of God on their behalf. Where sin lives, God will not abide. And there are five major lessons that the body of Christ, Christians, Born again believers can learn from these men. Before they before they shouted, they only lost four thousand men. So you would think after they shouted, they would have won the war. But after they shouted, they lost thirty thousand men. So what did they tell? You? They could have kept their shout. They could have backed up out of the fight. In other words. So, I want to say it again, before they shouted, they only lost 4,000 men, so in between losing 4,000 men and 30,000 men, too bad they didn't repent. They said, what is going on? We lost 4,000 men, something is wrong. The elders should have said, let's call a fast and a pray, you know, like Esther did, you know. We got, we need God. And so number three, what the church can learn from these men. The men shouting, and I want to put an emphasis on all of this, did not bring God to the battlefield. Woo, God did move his hand. Hallelujah. And number four, a holy shout is what God respect, honor, and respond to. And number five, and this is the saddest, but yet it's the eye opening. Before Phineas, wife, went into premature labor. Before she died in childbirth, she spoke these last unforgettable and timeless words. She said words. She said, the glory. She was she's in labor. When she heard all of this, she was in labor. She had premature labor. This affected her so deeply. She said, the glory is departed from Israel. Because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband, and she named the child before she died, Ishkabah, means no glory. Oh my Lord, she knew how extremely important it is and was to have the presence of God, the glory of God with us. She repeated this twice. The glory of God was departed from Israel because of the ark was taken. After the Philistines defeated 34,000 Israelites, they took the ark of God. Oh my Lord, she could not believe she went into premature labor and she died having birth because of her father-in-law and her husband. Without doubt, she knew how important it is. And we need to know the same thing, how important it is to keep the presence of God in our heart and our life. Hallelujah, in our soul and our spirit. This is true today. We need God. Come on, give a hand clap. We need God. Hallelujah. We need the glory of God. We need God's divine presence in our every, each and every day. Hallelujah. Satan is a roaring lion, has a roaring lion seeking who he may 
devour every single day. And we need God to help us against that enemy. Amen. Amen. Again, sin separates us from God. We don't need to be far off from God, and we don't need God to be far off from us. Amen. Amen. So, Eli, the father of these two sons, were sitting on the seat waiting for the results of the war. And the messengers came to him with the bad news that both of his son had died. Now notice this. It wasn't until the messenger said that the ark of God was taken that Eli fell off his seat backwards, broke his neck and died. It seemed as though Eli was more grief-stricken over the art of God being taken than the death of his two sons. Ooh, Lord, that's how important it is to keep the glory of God with us. The glory, when God's glory, God's presence is no longer with us, we are left to ourselves, Defen defenseless, unguarded, unprotected, helpless, and defeated by our enemies, especially the devil, when I said a little while ago, who come to steal, kill, and destroy the people of God. But who can fight us? Lord, as long as we got a God covering us like he did Job. Hallelujah! No weapon formed against us shall prosper. Hallelujah. If God be for us, I want to say it again. Who? Give me your name. And can be against us. Glory. Hallelujah. One main goal should always be. Our main goal should always be keeping God in the center of our heart, our mind, and our life. This is done by a holy and committed life before God. The absence of God's glory is the absence of God himself. This caused Israel to lose the sum total of 34,000 men in the war against the Philistines. This profound message is a reminder to Christians today, shouting, Hallelujah, in your sin, over your sin. Dancing over your sin, shouting over your sin, prophets, you know. We have a solemn obligation and responsibility, people of God, to protect the sanctity of our shout, our praise, and our worship. The purity of our shout and praise and worship. We don't want to hear the Lord say, Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. I never knew you. I never knew your praise. I never knew your worship. I never knew your shout. In other words, I don't know you. God could be asking this same question today. Like the Philistines asked the Israelites thousands of years ago. What does the noise of your great shout mean? And as you can see, it meant nothing to God. When I take, when I make a pound cake, I add flour, sugar, eggs, butter, and flavor. But if I mix beans, onions, liver, fish into the batter, this is something to be rejected and not accepted. So we cannot mix the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life in our shop. We can't mix rebellion, stubbornness, with which our witchcraft and idolatry in our shop. We cannot mix hypocrisy and disobedience and any other sin in our shop. If our praise and worship and shout is Shouting is mixed with sin. It is nothing again but a loud, thundering, irritating, useless noise to God. For God said, Be ye holy, for I am holy. To recap, the glory of Israel was 
Israel God, not just the ark by himself. Israel thought that their great shout and possessing the ark would cause God to fight for him. And in closing, we should strive to live a, excuse me, a holy life, to give God a holy shout, a holy worship, and holy praise. And here are some scriptures. In Psalms 47, 1b, Oh, clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. Psalms 98 and 4, Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All the earth. God would love that. You're talking about, they had all these men shouting. God would like the whole, can you imagine the whole world shouting? Hallelujah. The enemies wouldn't have a chance. Can you imagine? Hallelujah. For eight billion people in this world, it would be so nice if all of us would say, shouting unto God. Hallelujah. 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 Make a joyful noise unto the Lord. All the earth make a loud noise and rejoice and sing praise. And Psalms 51 and 1, praise you the Lord. Praise him in the sanctuary. When we go into church, give him a holy praise in his sanctuary. Praise him in the firmament of his power. And the last scripture, Psalms 101. Make a joyful noise. I want to put that into, into this in your mind again. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye land. He want everybody across the world to make what? A joyful noise unto the Lord. Hallelujah. It is never God's will to reject our shout, praise, or our worship. See, God dwells in the midst of praise. So come on, shout. Let us split the ears of the enemy. And the last scripture, let everybody stand. Hallelujah. Psalm 66 and 8. Oh, bless our Lord, you people. And make a noise, make a voice. And this is what I love. Hallelujah. Psalms 66 and 8. Oh, bless our God, you people. And make the voice of his praise to be heard. Come on, let's shout. Hallelujah. Come on. Everybody, let's shout. Hallelujah. Make a voice. Hallelujah. Of his praise to be heard. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Glory. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We bless your name, Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Come on. Let's say it again, Lord. Don't give up. Hallelujah. With all your heart. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let the praise be heard. Hallelujah. We thank God. We thank God. For it is a holy shout that he requires. God bless you in Jesus' name.